-hmm. from a perspective of a Greek individual. Now, uh, what I'm trying to work out is, you know, the fact that people are so much against reforms and so on, is it, is it a, a myopic thing that they don't understand that this is something that needs to be done, or is it maybe a, a rational response? Because for an individual, it might actually be better uh, if, if they do default and, you know, they, all, the, all the debt is forgotten and then they can kind of go and, and spend some more. It's actually both. Um, they don't understand that one of these days it has to come to an end. Um, it's, I mean, it's a natural reaction of, of, of the population. It's a much more natural reaction of the politicians that their horizons stop some way out there and not beyond where the, uh, the reckoning will, will eventually come. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, it's a rational response in the sense that uh, to the extent that you can free ride, you can persuade somebody else to, to do the bailing out for you, et cetera, et cetera. This looks more comfortable. There is a catch in that uh, which they must be worried about. If I were in the Greek government, I'd be really worried about it. And that is, if somebody's bailing you out, that somebody's going to tell you what to do whilst they're bailing you out. So eventually, uh, in terms of uh, fiscal policy, that, which covers all the... Um, Activities of the government, economic activities of the government at home, as it were, um, so on social security and on, on education policy, on health policy, all these things, is going to pass to the Germans. And uh, this is an opening. It sounds like the United States of Europe. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and there, are, there are plenty of people who think that's very, plenty of um, in the um, in the policy making elites who think this is a great idea. Um, to make a United States of Europe, provided they're the ones in the lead. So well, the, I suppose the Germans, not, 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 the, not the Greeks. Uh. But not the, well, no, the Greeks at the moment, of course, are thinking about financial protection and survival and are not worrying about what's going to happen further down the road. But if they take the help, of course, they're going to get told what to do. And this is why they're beginning to riot again. They rioted at the beginning of the process. They didn't want the uh, European Commission and uh, the IMF in. The riots then disappeared, and now they're starting to riot because they realize that whatever happens, they no longer have the freedom to set their own uh, uh, fiscal policies to meet their own desires. So basically, it's uh, um, an abdication of, response of uh, democracy at this point. You, you can't decide yourself. Yeah. And you, know, you can decide to have a, an economy with very little intervention from the state, which is Ireland as it was, um, or you can have a big intervention from the state. It doesn't matter, uh, like Sweden. Um, which is 60% of GDP is run by the state. But the only thing you have to decide is you can't have a gap between revenues and spending. So the whole argument is about you know, what you can do, your know, freedom to maneuver, to let those two things uh, go, uh, go apart. Mm. And uh, I don't know how, how they want to conclude that. The other way of looking at it, which is much more provocative, but is in the debate a little bit, is not that Greece should leave uh, the euro, but Germany should leave the euro. Uh, and I think the Germans actually would be, some of the Germans would be quite keen on that because the implication, the other side of it, the Germans are telling the Greeks what to do, but they're also having to provide the money. At the moment it's in the form of loans and guarantees, but very soon it'll be in taxpayers' money. And then there'll be a revolt in Germany saying, we just do not want to subsidize these irresponsible people. To which I should pause for a second, because it's not just the Greeks who are being irresponsible, but the banks who lent to the Greeks, <laughs> who turn out to be French and German. So it's quite complicated. Well, obviously, but if, if, if Germany goes, then there's uh, even less incentive for countries like right. uh, and and the, this uh, you, you there know, are uh, there are at least th there are three Groucho Marx theorems here, which if you're all too young to know about Groucho Marx, but one person does. <laughs> Groucho Marx's famous statement uh, was uh, he was a Jewish comedian in the 1930s in New York, and in those days the uh, very exclusive clubs didn't allow Jewish people in there. And uh, when he was elected a member, he said, I don't care to uh, belong to any club that is prepared to have me as a member. And here we've got the same thing. Germany actually should not be uh, prepared to be in the Euro because its performance is better than the others. So it, it inevitably is going to either suffer a worse performance or end up subsidizing other people. You know, so it's not in their interest. Of course, in everybody else's interest that Germany should be in so that they get the subsidies. So there's a groucher Marx theorem in there. And as you're quite right, I mean, once Germany leaves, then France leaves. And once France leaves, then the Netherlands leaves, and so on. So uh, politically, this is not a very sensible suggestion. But it, what it's doing is highlighting the problem of uh, the asymmetries again. And uh, yeah, I mean, from my view, and this is an instinctive reaction without a formal analysis behind it, but I'm willing to bet I could do that, 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 that you would look at you know, what kind of area it is sensible for the euro to be used in. And you'll get. Uh, Northern Europe, 
So it would actually include one or two countries which are not in the euro at the moment, but, uh, so we'll, uh, but leave out quite a lot of countries which are in the euro. So there's some kind of fault line between the Northern Europe, or if I want to be more provocative, I was beginning to call it the Teutonic Europe, but it's really the Calvinist Europe, and uh, the, the Latin um, Mediterranean style Europe. Uh, Britain and Ireland doesn't belong in either category, and the interesting question is where's France? We don't really know. It it's, could, be, it could be in either. Um, so that's another possible outcome. I don't see any of these things happening for political reasons, but just following the economic logic, uh, you could go down that track. Can I, uh, I actually want to move on to uh, uh, our next topic and then give, uh, give an opportunity to, to the students to ask. I've, I've prepared some slides um, and uh, they relate to the future um, because, I mean, the, the issue, people, the commentators are focused on the current debt issues, but uh, what many people don't realize is that the, uh, an even larger problem is, is looming on the horizon. So what, uh, what you can see here is... Um, um, is the old age dependency ratio, which is defined as the proportion of people 65 and older over uh, the, uh, the, the population 14 to uh, 65. And this is plotted for uh, all uh, European Union countries. And as you see from the 1960, there's been a, a consistent trend towards uh, the populations growing older. And, and obviously we know why. People live longer and people have fewer kids. So what you see is that... Um, um, now, now let's let's think through the implications of this, which which we're going to see on the next slide. Um, um, it, the, situ the situation actually looks much worse because the the light shaded area is the old age dependency ratios in 2000, which what you saw on the previous slide. Uh, but the pensioner per worker ratios are actually much higher than that. Uh, you see that it's, it's generally 50 to 100 percent higher than what the old age dependency ratio tells you. So, so what this implies is that we go uh, within, a, a, you know, from 1960 to 2040, we, we go from a situation where you have seven workers per, um, per, uh, per pensioner to a situation where you pretty much have one one worker per uh, one pensioner. And so we, we know what it means in terms of lower taxes and, and higher pension spending. But the next slide is actually showing that, that health expenditures are also a, a big problem because the, if you have older people, this, this shows you the, the profile um, on, on a public spending on health as, as a function of, um, of age. And what you see is that it picks up significantly once people reach uh, uh, 60 or 65. So it's not only pensions, it's the health uh, that, that is causing all the problems. So, so given, given the future, um, um, how does it change the kind of uh, solutions that we should be looking for uh, when we're considering the current uh, debt crisis? Uh, well, I suppose the first answer is that um, first things first, solve the, the current crisis. When you go into a difficult situation, it's obviously much more difficult if you're badly prepared. And that's to say you go into a deficit-creating situation, and this is uh, likely to create much bigger deficits than, uh, than you're used to before, at least initially. Uh, you don't want to be in deficit when you start. Uh, that, would, uh, that would help. So it, it doesn't change um, what you want to do here and now, except for the fact that you want to have a pretty good plan as to what you're going to do the moment you've got uh, control back on the existing situation. Well, to me, it says that, you know, the, the way we've been going about it, just trying to patch up the, the current problem sure, and move it away six months later, I mean, once you take this into account, that, that, that is clearly not, not Yeah, a, right, but it would be, it, 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 be very difficult to try and to solve two problems at once. So I think probably it makes some sense uh, to do that. I mean, we don't know when these, uh, well, we do if we look at, oh, no, that's age so, group. So yeah, some of the others, the well, timeline matters. starting to bite. Very, it's starting to bite, and it's very serious. And by, and, uh, by and large, I think, not, uh, with one or two exceptions, no governments do have serious plans for doing this. So the, the real answer to your question is that they need to have some people put on one side and say, don't worry about whether you're going to go default on uh, in July. Worry about what's going to happen in 2020, 2030, 2040, et cetera. Mm. Um, and I think uh, these, these situations are, are actually quite different. And this is reflected in this one, for example, which is interesting. The bottom uh, lines at the right-hand end where they're paying significantly less per older person, and so the burden is rising less, turn out to be, oh, well, the dotted line is Luxembourg, but the dashed line is uh, Denmark, I think, and then Sweden is the pink one above that. 
So I know for a fact that Finland did a lot of work on this and they have, I don't know the details of the plan, but they do have plans for dealing with the uh, increasing aging and the demands that that puts on fiscal policy. And it's very likely that the Swedes have as well and probably the Danes have as well. This is why these things are, are likely to be a lot lower for them than for others. So there are things you can do. It's a bit difficult to, to treat all uh, countries the same. These, of course, are dependency ratios. So there are a number of people, but of course the people don't necessarily the pensioners in different countries don't necessarily get as much money. So if you're uh, going off health now and back onto uh, pensions, if you've effectively privatized the pension um, um, system, uh, it'll be easier. So if you, if you do it in numbers of dollars, mm. uh, the picture might be a bit different. Mm. Um, but well, but that, seems, that's what's seems, coming up here. Uh, uh, these numbers I saw yesterday, I don't know what to make of them. So, so th this is just to, um, this is the, uh, the net present value as a percentage of GDP of the effect of, of the aging populations that mm. you just saw uh, on, on um, fiscal deficits. And what mm. you see, that's the, that's the second column. These, these are huge uh, mm. for most countries in the order of three, four, uh, five hundred uh, mm. percent of GDP. Mm. And, and just uh, uh, as, a, as a benchmark, you compare them to, the, to all, the, all the stimuli from uh, the global financial crisis, and they're very small, except mm. for we, we discussed Ireland, where, which is the kind of the other way around. But mm. uh, so, so again, this just, this just tells you the, the, the size of the problem. And yeah, obvi yeah, obviously sure. the, the issue, and this is a, a, a focus of, of several of research papers that we've written, is, is what, what this actually implies for monetary policy. There, yeah. There's many theories saying that these, uh, these fiscal excesses might actually spill into monetary policy oh, and, and create higher indeed. inflation. And I, I'm afraid we might have to uh, leave that for another time. In fact, I've got uh, Eric Lieper um, yeah. here, who's uh, the, the most prolific researcher on the, in the area of monetary fiscal interactions. Uh, he's coming uh, in a few weeks' yeah, time. Yeah, because so I mean, if you get huge uh, deficits, I mean, it's the ratio of the right hand to the left-hand column there. Yeah. If you get huge deficits, which you can't eliminate any other way, the normal way of doing it, you can't do it in the EU, but outside the EU, is to, is to inflate them away, which means you let your exchange rate fall and uh, your burden is reduced because the, the real value of it mm. falls because prices are rising, so you inflate it away. That's and right. you might well expect that to happen. So that's a form of the interaction between fiscal and monetary. Something has been driven from the fiscal to the monetary. Mm.